This video gives a proof of the second derivatives test for distinguishing when critical points are local maximums, local minimums, or saddles. The second derivatives test applies to functions whose second partial derivatives exist and are continuous in a region around the point of interest x0, y0. That condition is so that we can apply Clairaut's theorem to say that the second mixed partials, f sub xy and f sub yx, are equal. Assuming that condition, let's suppose we have a critical point, a point x0, y0, such that the derivative in the x direction and the derivative in the y direction are both zero. We calculate the discriminant d, which is the determinant of f sub xx, f sub xy, f sub yx, and f sub yy, in other words, f sub xx, f sub yy, minus f sub xy, f sub yx, or, in other words, f sub xx, f sub yy, minus f sub xy, squared, using Clairaut's theorem to write the mixed partials as equal to each other. So this is the discriminant. It's called the discriminant because it's going to help us distinguish or discriminate between what kind of feature our graph has at the critical point. If the discriminant is positive and the second partial f sub xx is also positive, then f has a local minimum at x0, y0. The condition that f sub xx is positive should remind you of the calculus 1 condition if f double prime of x0 is positive at a critical point for a calculus 1 function of one variable, then that corresponds to a local minimum. If the discriminant is once again positive, but f sub xx at the critical point is less than zero, then f has a local maximum at that critical point. Again, this should remind you of calculus 1, where if f double prime of x0 is less than zero at a critical point, we have a local maximum. If the discriminant is less than zero, however, we have a situation that can't happen in calculus 1. We have a saddle point at x0, y0. A saddle point is neither a local maximum nor a local minimum, but it looks like a local maximum along one curve of approach, and it looks like a local minimum along another curve of approach. It can happen that the discriminant d is equal to zero at x0, y0. If this happens, then the second derivatives test is inconclusive. No conclusion can be drawn. Please note that when applying the second derivatives test, we evaluate the discriminant at the critical point x0, y0. To prove the second derivatives test, I'm going to focus on the directional derivative of the directional derivative of f at the point x0, y0, where u is any unit vector. This is similar to looking at f sub xx or f sub yy, except we're going in an arbitrary direction u. It's helpful to look at these directional derivatives of directional derivatives because if d sub u of d sub u of f at x0, y0 is always positive, then our surface will be concave up in every direction. And so it has to have a local min at x0, y0. If, on the other hand, d sub u, d sub u of f is always negative, then the surface will be concave down in every direction. So there has to be a local max. Finally, if d sub u, d sub u of f is sometimes positive and sometimes negative, then the surface will be concave up in one direction and concave down in another direction, and so it will look like a saddle. So let's calculate d sub u of d sub u of f, where u is some unit vector hk. If we start by computing d sub u of f, that's the gradient of f dotted with u, so it's the vector f sub x, f sub y dotted with hk, or f sub x, h plus f sub y, k. Now we take the directional derivative of that quantity, so that means we take the gradient of that quantity, 
dotted with u, or in other words, the derivative in the x direction of the quantity and the derivative of in the y direction of the quantity dotted with hk. Since h and k are constants, this means we just do f sub xx times h plus f sub yx times k, and for the directional derivative in the y direction, I get f sub xy h plus f sub yyk. So now I'll just take the dot product, and I'll rewrite this by distributing, so I get f sub xx h squared plus f sub yx hk plus f sub xy hk plus f sub yy k squared. Now by Clairaut's theorem, the mixed partials are equal, so this simplifies to f sub xx h squared plus 2 f sub xy hk plus f sub yy k squared. That's my directional derivative of my directional derivative of f. Now this expression is reminding me a lot of a quadratic equation. So let me save this expression and get rid of some of the other intermediate work. And now I'm going to consider the related quadratic function g of t, which is f sub xx t squared plus 2 f sub xy t plus f sub yy. Or I could write this as g of t is a t squared plus b t plus c, where a is f sub xx, b is 2 f sub xy, and c is f sub yy. All of these second partials are considered to be evaluated at x naught y naught. After we consider this regular quadratic in one variable t, we'll see how it relates back to this expression that we started with. Now you're probably familiar with the fact that a quadratic function has its own discriminant. What's a kind of interesting is that the discriminant for this quadratic equation, in other words, the expression b squared minus 4ac, is actually intimately connected with the discriminant d for functions of two variables. That's because b squared minus 4ac is equal to 2f sub xy squared minus 4f sub xx f sub yy, which is 4 f sub xy squared minus 4 f sub x x f sub y y, which is exactly negative 4 times our discriminant d. So now, if d is bigger than 0 and f sub x x is also bigger than 0, then we know that b squared minus 4ac is going to be less than 0 since it's negative 4 times d and we still have f sub x x is bigger than 0. That means that our quadratic equation has no real solutions. In other words, our function lies all the way above the x-axis or all the way below the x-axis. But since f sub x x is also known as a is the leading coefficient, and that's positive, we know that we actually lie above the x-axis. So g of t is positive for all values of t. So in particular, if we look at g of h over k for k not equal to 0, we know that that expression has to be bigger than 0. And so k squared g of h over k also has to be greater than 0 since we just multiplied by k squared, a positive number. Simplifying and replacing a, b, and c with their values in terms of the second partials, we get that a h squared plus b h k plus c k squared is bigger than zero, or in other words, f sub x x h squared plus 2 f sub x y h k plus f sub y y k squared is greater than zero for all h k as long as k is not zero. And in fact, even if k is zero, then those terms will drop out and we'll just have f sub xx h squared, which has got to be positive because we're assuming f sub xx is positive. So in fact, this expression is bigger than zero no matter what h and k is. And so we're in this situation here where 
this d sub u of d sub u is always positive, and we have a local minimum. So we've just proved the first case of the discriminant test, the case when the discriminant is positive and f sub x x is also positive. The case when the discriminant is positive and f sub x x is negative is very, very similar. In fact, we can just switch this inequality to a neg uh, less than sign and this inequality to a less than sign, and then we know since our leading coefficient a is negative, we're in the situation where the graph of the parabola has no real zeros but is pointing downwards like this. So we know that our g of any t is going to be less than zero, and so g of h over k is less than zero, and doing the same calculation, we just get the conclusion that our d sub u of d sub u is always negative. So we're in this second situation that corresponds to a local maximum. Finally, let's clear this all out and look at the situation when d is actually less than zero. So if d is less than zero, that means that for the quadratic equation, b squared minus 4ac is bigger than zero because remember, b squared minus 4ac is negative 4 times d. So if we're graphing our parabola g of t, that means our parabola is actually going to intersect the x-axis, either look like that or maybe pointing up, something like that. In any case, we're going to have two real roots, and we're going to have some t-value for which g of t is negative and another t-value for which g of t is positive. So I'll write that down. Now we can use these values of t1 and t2 to find unit vectors u1, the components h1, k1, for which d sub u, d sub u is less than zero, and a unit vector u2 for which d u sub 2, d u sub 2 is greater than zero. Basically, we want t1 to be h1 over k1, but if we just make h1 equal t1 and k1 equal 1, sort of the standard thing to try, then that won't be a unit vector. So we have to normalize and let h1 be t1 over the square root of 1 plus t1 squared, and k1 be 1 over the square root of 1 plus t1 squared. If we do that and then plug h1 over k1 into g, and then multiply this by k1 squared, on both sides and simplify using the fact that a, b, and c are related to the second partials, then we get exactly that uh, this k1 squared g of h1 over k1 is equal to f sub xx h1 squared plus 2 f sub xy h1 k1 plus f sub yy k1 squared. And so since we know that g of our t1 and h1 over k1 equals t1, since we know this is, what do we say, negative, then k1 squared times is negative. So our d sub u u is negative for that value of h1 and k1. And we can similarly find an h2 k2 for which the partial, the directional derivative of the directional derivative is positive, just using the same, same construction with t2 instead of t1. And so therefore, we have finally made it to this last case where we have sometimes the second directional derivative is negative and sometimes it's positive, and therefore we must have a saddle. So that concludes the proof of the second derivatives test. So in this video, we proved the second derivatives test, which tells us how the discriminant helps us discriminate between whether we have a local max, a local min, or a saddle at a critical point. And the really cool thing about the proof is that this discriminant here is actually related to the discriminant for quadratic equations that tells us how many zeros a parabola has.